Hello world, Calc Programmer one here. Today I wanted to talk about a new initiative that just came up on YouTube and on a forum lately. Um, if you follow Gamers Nexus on YouTube, you might have seen the recent video about OpenPleb. It's a new initiative that is going to be super important to OpenRGB, I think. And I just wanted to make everyone in the community aware of this new initiative. So uh, I have the forum post pulled up. So first of all, um, Gamers Nexus just recently posted this video, and it's uh, kind of a collaboration between Steve from Gamers Nexus and Wendell from Level 1 Techs. And I'm not going to play the video here. Just go watch it for yourself. I'll link it in the description. It is basically the Wendell from Level 1 Techs wants to create some sort of open, like, initiative um like a non-profit organization that is going to work with the hardware manufacturers and try to get them to open up a little bit when it comes to proprietary implementations of um, protocols and sensors and rgb and, and they, they sort of just want to go and try to get manufacturers to be more open about anything proprietary that they make so they have this uh, forum post, which I'll also link below, and uh, where he describes, where Wendell describes uh, what exactly this mission, this initiative is. And it looks like kind of the main focus is to push on the companies that make proprietary devices such as RGB, but also sensors and motherboard components, fans, uh, cooling devices like uh, heat sinks or uh, water coolers, pumps, and anything like with the new, a lot of devices have LCD screens built in, but the interfaces for those are entirely proprietary. So I can see a lot of reasons why uh, this would be important, not only uh, from the software and the protocol side, which I think is probably the biggest for OpenRGB, but also in the pinouts and physical layer of all the new connectivity between RGB fans, fan controllers, and motherboards. Uh, that seems to be a complaint that people are having where, you know, NZXT has their own fans, and Corsair has their own fans, Thermaltake has their own fans. And so if everyone has their own fans, so like in this computer I've got NZXT fans, they have a special connector that only connects to an NZXT fan controller. Uh, but then you have your normal fans with a three or four pin fan header. But a lot of companies are trying to make connectors for fans with um, RGB built in. And then they're making their own proprietary connector to handle all that. And so you end up with a dependence on this controller. If you buy these fans, if you buy these fans and they break, then you have to keep buying those fans. It's a vendor lock-in. And so this is kind of becoming a mess and people are starting to push back on it. And I'm, I'm really happy for that because the whole point of OpenRGB is the reason I created in the first place. It was originally I put together my first Ryzen PC, which isn't this one. And I was just frustrated that I had all this RGB installed in my computer. All of it worked on Windows, but it required like five different programs to operate. I had Razer keyboard, Razer mouse. I think I had some Corsair stuff. I had Asus uh, motherboard, I had Gigabyte GPU, so that's like four or five different applications just to control all the RGB, and none of it synchronized, and all of that software was bloated, took up gigabytes worth of background RAM, CPU, uh, it was just a mess. And I'm thinking, it's RGB, all you're doing is sending three bytes, red, green, and blue, to an LED, how difficult can that really be? So that's what led me and a bunch of people on GitHub to start reverse engineering Asus Aura back in 2017. And that work eventually became OpenRGB. It went through a process where I made something called Asus Aura, or Open Aura SDK. And then from there, I just kept reverse engineering devices and OpenRGB was born. So that's kind of where it started. But how could things be better? And that's what OpenPleb is going for, is how can we make this whole process better? Right now, we get a new device, like this AOC keyboard that I just added to OpenRGB. I bought this keyboard at Micro Center. It was on sale. Uh, I thought, 
hey, a new RGB keyboard, that would be fun to add open RGB. But of course, there's no documentation provided with the keyboard on how to talk to it. There's just go to uh, gmenu dot whatever the a AOC's website, download the gmenu software, and that will control your keyboard. But what if I want to control it on Linux? What if I want to synchronize it with all my other devices? That's not going to happen with that software, especially when that software doesn't have an SDK, which gmenu does not. So the next step is reverse engineering. So what is reverse engineering? Well, reverse engineering is I open up the software for this thing and I open up Wireshark, which is a USB and network capture utility. And so I start sending commands from the official software to change the keyboard. And then I look through the Wireshark and it captures all the packets. And we have to kind of go through and send you know, all red, all green, all blue, and figure out which bytes in the packet correspond to uh, which RGB values, which modes, which settings, and kind of decode basically from just looking at the data and trying to figure out what it means, and then go re-implement it. So, uh, so that's not perfect. And one of the big things about reverse engineering is one, it takes a lot of time. It's frustrating to uh, reverse engineer. And the thing is, we have reverse engineered a lot of stuff with OpenRGB. We're getting kind of good at it, especially for USB human interface devices, HID, which are keyboards, mice, um, mouse pads. A lot of stuff is HID protocol based. We're getting pretty good at reverse engineering those. But Things like graphics cards, uh, they use I2C, uh, RAM, I2C, motherboard, some use I2C. I2C is a lot more difficult to reverse engineer. Sometimes you even have to resort to hardware probing, like getting out an oscilloscope, finding the I2C lines on the motherboard and actually probing them, um, trying to decode them using a logic analyzer, like a PyPico to capture some data. Um, that gets to be a lot more of a mess than what you can do with keyboards and mice and stuff. And so it's just, it all kind of is a mess to support an open RGB. And we have our processes and we've written some tools to make it easier. But the one thing that's going to hold true no matter what is that if the companies would just provide protocol documentation, our lives would be 100% easier because we wouldn't have to do any reverse engineering. They would just give us a document that says, here's the format of the packet that sets the keyboard to a direct mode. You, here's where you put the RG and B values for every key on the keyboard. And here's the message, or here's the different modes. They correspond to these values. These values correspond to like speed, brightness, direction, um, whether it's random color or uh, user set color, things like that. If they had provided a document that said, Here's the packet size. Here's where everything goes. Here's how to send it. Uh, here's all the IDs you need. And then we could just write code based on that document. And our code would be a lot more guaranteed to be correct because we're actually following something that the manufacturers and the people who wrote the firmware and the keyboard actually put out. So another problem with reverse engineering is that you're only going to get as good as the official software. And sometimes the official software doesn't actually implement everything that the firmware level, the hardware level implements. Because reverse engineering is just, we're capturing the packets the official software sends, and then we're trying to replicate that behavior. So uh, let's take the ASUS, or the, uh, not ASUS, uh, AMD Wraith Prism, for example, this cooler is actually a device made by Cooler Master um, for AMD. And I don't know if anyone knows it, but the Intel Arc A770, the RGB on that is also made by Cooler Master for Intel. So idea being is that AMD and Intel didn't want to design their own RGB controllers and write their own RGB software. So they just contracted out to someone who's good at um, RGB, which Cooler Master, at, I would say Cooler Master is good at uh, both making coolers and RGB. Um, so it turns out that these, the AMD Wraith Prism and the Intel Arc A770 actually use virtually the same protocol. And well, 
at least for the direct mode, which is what I'm using right now. But when we first reverse engineered the um, Wraith Prism, this was one of the first devices I added to OpenRGB. Well, the official software for this thing doesn't actually even use the direct mode, which would allow for software-driven effects, which is what's going on now. I'm using the OpenRGB effects plugin with the bubbles effect, and it's synchronizing across all the devices. But because the official software for the Prism didn't have direct mode implemented, all it had was the ability to configure the built-in modes, like the rainbow cycling, and the there was like a bounce effect where it went back and forth, um, I think one where it just spun around the ring. There are several different built-in effects, and they were nice effects, but I wanted to be able to synchronize it with everything else. And the best I was able to do for a long time was to control the AMD logo, the fan, and then the whole entire ring as one LED. So it was basically three different zones of one color each. And that was the best I could do. And so I didn't think the Wraith Prism even offered the ability to control the individual lights around the ring uh, from USB because the official software didn't implement that. And so for two years, OpenRGB only supported setting the ring to a single color. And it was a case where if you wanted an RGB build and you wanted to customize everything and have really good effects, the Wraith Prism didn't make much sense, even though it was included in the box in a lot of cases, because, well, you couldn't control all the LEDs on the ring. It wasn't as good as what you could get from a third party. But then... I got the Intel Arc A770 two years later. I got it when it came out last year. And when I was reverse engineering that, I noticed the protocol looked awfully familiar. And I knew that it was a Cooler Master design. And you can also tell because the little USB cable that connects the RGB for the Arc and the Prism, it's the same little USB cable. So I figured there was some overlap there. They had similar built-in hardware modes. They had similar software. And you could tell that there was some kind of shared DNA between these two, even though one's AMD and one's Intel. And what I found was that the Intel software package for the Arc A770 actually did have uh, use of direct mode, where it was doing software-generated effects to preview uh, whenever you were setting up the effects on the software. It would actually generate them in real time in the software so that the, what was showing on the actual card and what was showing on the screen were the same uh, picture. And then I got curious. I, I figured out how to do direct mode on the ARC. And I was like, you know, this protocol is so similar to the Prism, and they're both Cooler Master. I wonder if I could control the individual LEDs by using the protocol I discovered from the ARC on the Prism. So I tried it. And sure enough, as you can see now, uh, yes, it did work. You are able to control the individual LEDs around the ring. But we didn't know that until two years after this thing was reverse engineered and added to OpenRGB because the official software didn't actually tell us how to do that. And because there was no documentation from the people who wrote the firmware, Cooler Master, uh, we, did, we had no idea that protocol section even existed. We didn't know there was a command to control the individual LEDs. We only had to go figure it out from a completely different product that had some shared history and then just experimentation. The problem with experimentation is that it, it's risky. I mean, these commands were never actually officially used on the Prism, at least in the official software. So maybe it works. Or maybe it bricks it. Maybe it turns it into a brick. Maybe it sets the LEDs to some unrecoverable state. And unfortunately, that's just a problem with reverse engineering. And anytime you do reverse engineering, you run the risk of bricking things. And uh, if we go back to that forum post over here, you can actually read through this. And one of the comments made, let's... Uh, I'll just search for SPD here, and we'll zoom in on that. So there was a comment. There have also been instances in the past where, for example, bad RGB control software, and we're talking uh, OEM software from the manufacturer here, has erased user memory's SPD chips. 
So SPD chips are little I squared C flash chips on each memory module that contain information about that module, like capacity, RAM timings, uh, RAM frequency, XMP, uh, Expo data, anything like that is stored in the SPD and the BIOS reads that on power up to configure the RAM to the proper speed, the proper size, the proper everything to make it work. If you corrupt the SPD, the BIOS could set the memory timings to something that the RAM doesn't support, or it could set the voltage to something that the RAM doesn't support. And when you do that, you run the risk of, well, you run the risk of hardware damage in the case of voltage, as we've seen with the recent AMD processor voltage issues, but not for RAM, but you could imagine a scenario where a corrupt SPD would set an over voltage on the RAM and potentially damage it. Luckily, um, that didn't seem, didn't seem to be the case. It was just rendering systems unbootable because of timings or bad configuration. But this is, was a problem with the official software. Um, you can look in here and say, you know, it's it's bad. It's an issue um, that the SPD was corrupted. And this is by official software. Now the problem is, is whenever I was reverse engineering my Trident ZRGB memory uh, to write OpenRGB, I ran into this issue. Now I don't remember whether mine was self-caused because I had sent something to the RAM that I shouldn't have and corrupted it, or whether it was because I was using the OEM software for reverse engineering, or it could have been a conflict between open RGB and another piece of software trying to talk to the RAM at the same time. One of these situations happened and I did in fact corrupt the SPD on one of the one or two of the sticks of my four sticks of Trident ZRGB. Luckily I was able to rearrange the sticks which got the computer to boot again but then I had to use a paid program called Typhoon Burner which uh, let me reflash those SPDs to their correct values and basically fix the issue and that shouldn't be something that anyone has to run into because most users don't know what spd is and if it corrupts they don't know how to fix it uh, they don't, wouldn't even know that it is something that should be fixed or could be broken and and so whenever you have standards that are this bad and this messy and then you're trying to make the software situation better by writing your own software, but then you have to base it all on reverse engineering. Well, you just, there's, it's a minefield. And so you could run into issues like that. So why would this open pleb initiative help? Well, if they actually get what they want, what they, if they actually get what they're going after and they are able to get even a handful of manufacturers to start publishing actual data sheets, protocol documentation, hardware interface specifications, uh, anything like that, I think we would be a lot happier on OpenRGB because we would have confidence that the protocols we've written to talk to devices are actually correct. There are a lot of cases in reverse engineering where we do figure out what most of the bytes mean we we figure out where to put the rg and b values we figure out where the mode values go the speed the um all of the different parameters that open rgb can set but then we still notice that the packets have a handful of other bytes that we don't know what they do so we just have to assume that we just mimic what they were in the original packet and just send them on as as is and hope for the best, but unfortunately, maybe those bytes mean something that we don't know, and we have no way of knowing unless we have documentation, or whether the if we have some toggle on the official software that lets us change things, because really that's the only way we get information is by changing things in the official software. But again, if we had documentation from the manufacturer that said this byte does this, this byte does that, we can just fill them all in well that would just solve our issue right away we wouldn't have to spend the time reverse engineering we would just be able to write code and we'd know that code was good and i mean barring some implementation issue on our end where we 
filled the packet in incorrectly and didn't match the documentation or barring the documentation being incomplete where it says something is incorrect and we fill it in according to the documentation that's wrong, but hopefully that shouldn't happen. The documentation should be accurate. I think that would be a huge benefit for OpenRGB. It would be a huge benefit for all of the community developers who help with developing OpenRGB. And it would be a huge benefit just to the PC ecosystem as a whole. I mean, I would say Linux ecosystem mainly because there are so many open source driver and community maintained driver projects on Linux. Uh, one that was called out in Steve's video was LM sensors, which is the package that it's a lot of kernel modules as well as a user space package that handles reading sensors in the hardware like temperature, voltages, um, currents, battery percent, uh, all sorts of things get handled by LM sensors. And it's a very important project to Linux. And I know there are a lot of motherboards out there because their Super I.O. chip, which is the chip that usually maintains the fans and the sensors, doesn't have data sheets available. I know Nuviton got thrown around in Steve's video a lot, and Nuviton makes Super I.O. chips, and I've actually worked on a Nuviton SM bus driver for certain motherboards, uh, especially Asus ARA Intel boards from like the Z270, Z370 era, use a Nuviton Super I.O. to communicate with the ARA controller for RGB, but that Nuviton controller also handles a whole bunch of other stuff. It can measure voltages, it can measure fan speeds, sensors, temperatures, and Nuviton has public, publicly available data sheets for some of their chips, but there are a lot of chips that they do not have publicly available data sheets for. I think there's sometimes a case where a motherboard vendor will come in and request their custom version of the Super I.O. chip from Nuviton, and that customized variant doesn't get a publicly available data sheet, whereas some of their more standardized ones do. Because I definitely use the Nuviton data sheet to write my SM bus driver, which made it a lot easier than trying to just reverse engineer it, which is what we were originally trying to do. When I found that data sheet online, that made the process so much easier um, to write that uh, driver, the I2C NCT6793D driver, or in uh, OpenRGB it was called o I I2C NCT 6775, which is a driver that I was writing for Linux to be able to use that Nuviton uh, I2C interface uh, to support certain devices that's part of the kernel patch. And then I was working to get it upstreamed, but uh, that's been put on hold for now. I need to go back and resume that at some point. So, yeah, and then other projects I can think of would be anything that deals with fan control on Linux would be big. Anything that deals with sensors, anything that deals with RGB. But then really anything you can think of that I know there are other aspects of PC hardware. I know Steve uh, mentioned a power supply that had some sort of software configuration that Corsair released this power supply. It was a super expensive power supply. And then two years later, they dropped support for the software. And now he can't change how the power uh, rails are set up in the power supply, which is a pretty big deal on a high power power supply that you now expected to be able to reconfigure for what kind of loads you're connecting to it. And now you can't because they got rid of the software that's that's stupid and so there's just so many different little aspects of proprietary software that gets abandoned and especially linux users where the proprietary software just simply never existed on linux to begin with and the same can hold true for mac os users in a lot of cases that i think this is just a really good initiative and i'd like to um support Wendell and Level 1 Techs and Gamers Nexus in this endeavor, uh, however I can as an OpenRGB developer, because I think it's super important that we go out there and try to find a solution that doesn't just involve reverse engineering everything that comes out. I mean, I still enjoy doing the reverse engineering. I like those kind of puzzles and trying to figure things out. But is it the best way to go about this? Absolutely not. Um, but 
there's been a few companies who have contacted me regarding open RGB and offered to uh, send me things or uh, support in some way. One of them was HyperX. Um, before they got bought out by HP, they sent me a kit of Fury uh, DDR4 memory. And they also sent me a hardware documentation, a protocol data sheet for that, which was super useful. Now, the thing is, I had already reverse engineered it at the time. And I had already implemented using a stick of Predator memory, which is basically the same protocol, just a little bit different physical, physical design. But it was very helpful to be able to compare the stuff I had reverse engineered versus their actual documentation, which confirmed a lot of what I had was correct. But then there were a few spots where I was iffy about what I had reverse engineered that the documentation either confirmed or it told me what I needed to focus on or how I could change it to improve it. And that was super helpful. But unfortunately, that happened really early on in OpenRGB's development. And that was pretty much the only time I've ever received documentation from a company once on Reddit. HyperX, in a completely, I, I think it was an unrelated scenario, uh, they reached out to me on Reddit and they sent me a keyboard, the HyperX Alloy Elite, and I talked to someone else at HyperX. Uh, they didn't send any documentation. They just sent me a free keyboard, so I still had to reverse engineer that one. Um, but at least they were willing to support with hardware. Um, but that's been really the only times that I've had companies reach out and help with the project. So, um, yeah, I would like to see a little bit more involvement from the official manufacturers. Uh, of course, OpenRGB is and always will be a community project. It will be open source and maintained by the community. And anything that is, you know, a manufacturer trying to put in something that's not pro user, I'm not going to let that get merged in. But if they do want to actually help out and provide documentation, I think that is would be an amazing help for the community. And I really hope that this initiative does something in that respect. So I think I've gone on for long enough about this. So thanks for sticking it out. Thanks for listening and thanks for watching. Um, I'll see you in the next one. Thanks.